Which brings us to part three. Episode three is actually one of the best episodes of this entire show because pretty much nothing happens. Whenever stuff happens in this show, it's almost invariably an assault on the shields of credibility. In fact, this is a pretty consistent theme across Disney Star Wars. Characters sitting in a room or wordlessly staring into space might be boring. You might sit there wondering whether this is really the best use of a hundred million dollar budget, but nothing is being broken during these scenes. Right up until episode four of Ahsoka, I was quite comfortable in calling it one of the least of all the Disney Star Wars productions, not because it has anything in particular to recommend it, but because I wasn't sitting there throwing things at the TV and yelling no! every five seconds. There's only so much of the Mandalorian a guy can take, alright? Currently, the CIA use a technique called Mando boarding in their black sites, where they tie terrorists to a chair and make them watch Mando season three on repeat. Let me go, seriously. Yeah, let us go. I can take, dude. Perhaps. As for now, you must live in exile on the moon. No! Okay, okay. I'll tell you where the triangle is. Even the hardest terrorists tend to crack it around the point a suddenly pterodactyl regurgitates a Mandalorian child in episode four. but most don't even make it that far. That being said, the words pretty much nothing entail that a little bit of something does happen in Ahsoka episode three, and this inevitably drags everything down. So let's begin. We kick off in hyperspace, which for reasons called the plot, takes time to travel through in this episode. Quite a long time, in fact, even as it quite often doesn't in other Disney Star Wars productions. Mando season 3 was similarly inconsistent on the point of hyperspace travel. Sometimes it takes time, as when Mando sleeps and Grogu ogles space whales on their way to Navarro, and on other occasions it takes no time at all, such as when Captain Teva insta-hops from Navarro to Coruscant. Star Wars has always been a little bit inconsistent on this point, as I explained in my last Mandalorian video. Last time Titanic ever saw. I don't think I've ever tried so hard to be gay and made such a dismal mess. Star Wars has always been a bit hazy on travel times between various locations, and much of it depends on what you're reading or watching, from when, featuring what ship, what hyperdrive, what droid, and which locations. I think it's fairly well established that journeys between places on established hyperlanes, say from Coruscant to Naboo, may take a few hours, while places further out and away from established lanes can take days or even weeks or even months. Then again, even that could be broken as and when the plot demands it, such as George Lucas implying several hours or even a day's journey between Tatooine and Coruscant or Tatooine and Alderaan, only for Anakin to zip from Coruscant to Mustafar in the space of a single scene transition. Yeah, yeah. And I should stress that this criticism is not that we must always be shown the time spent traveling through hyperspace. It's that universes need a consistent sense of time. If we're skipping a long hyperspace sequence, events elsewhere in the galaxy should also be skipped. When we pick them up again, we should see that the skipped time has in fact passed. If a hyperspace journey between scenes takes a day, events in the galaxy progress a day. On the whole, I quite like not skipping hyperspace journeys. They are naturally quiet moments in the plot that you can use to explore characters. Think the journey to Alderaan in A New Hope. It doesn't take very long, but it's full of useful and relevant stuff. Kenobi training Luke, Han's cocksure arrogance at having escaped Tatooine, feeding into his cynical dismissal of the Force. <laughs> Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Luke in this scene is more angry and frustrated with Han's attitude than Obi-Wan Kenobi is, though Obi-Wan is the Jedi and Luke is not. You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful force controlling everything. Obi-Wan smiling at hand betrays character experience and philosophy. He's a wise, old, well-balanced guy who can laugh at hand dismissing the core tenet of his faith because he sees through Han's bravado and he knows what Han does not. We learn a lot about Obi-Wan in this exchange. Luke, by contrast, is focused, determined, and short-tempered. He's the one who takes umbrage at hand dismissing the force 
Force, though he barely understands it himself. This fact actually precludes his mastery of the Force. The stress of the previous battle, the lingering anger at the loss of his aunt and uncle, his frustrated failures with the training remote all contribute to his inability to sense its movements. He's too young and rash and emotional to attain the right mindset. Obi-Wan's calm and friendly encouragement defuses his anger and allows him to reach out to the Force. Stretch out with your feelings. You see? You can do it. The only time Obi-Wan's demeanor is anything less than humorful and tolerant in this exchange is when Han dismisses Luke's success as the product of luck. That's when Obi-Wan says, not quite darkly, but not cheerfully either, in my experience there's no such thing as luck. I call it luck. In my experience, there's no such thing as luck. We deduce then just that. Obi-Wan has experience that Han does not, and Han is misattributing to chance what Kenobi knows to be the will of the Force. So we're not just learning about the characters in this scene, we're also learning with the characters. Luke is our eyes and ears in this universe, the one closest to the audience in terms of prior familiarity with the subjects being discussed, i.e. none. Obi-Wan isn't just teaching Luke, we're not just learning about the people on the screen, he's also teaching us. It's one of the three glimpses at the Force we get throughout the opening third of A New Hope. Obi-Wan's mind trick on the stormtroopers, Darth Vader's choke on the Imperial officer, Luke predicting the remote's movements. These are small glimpses in very different situations with very different applications, meaning that though we don't understand the Force in its fullness, we've been given some sense of its scale. Nominally at least, the opening of Ahsoka Episode 3 attempts to replicate this scene, but with much less skill and even less to say. I'll just describe it first, and then we can break it down a little bit. We see Huge Wang taking Sabine through various lightsaber forms and movements. Our shot, and it's worth noting here that Huge Wang has multiple arms capable of holding and using multiple weapons, because we'll never see that again, even when it would be incredibly useful. Huge Wang displays the results of her training, and we learn that she is very rusty. She recalls the basics, but as Huge Wang tells us overtly, Not bad. But not good. It's been a while. Obviously. I see you still remember the basics. Enough to get by? Mm, barely. She barely remembers them. There are her boobs. Sabine then does what at a push could be called acting in this scene, which is meant to convey her injured pride and her frustration. Barely. Liang, let's try something else. How about Zatochi? Oh no. I'm not certain Lady Ren is ready for that technique. He's not a princess, he's a dude! Ahsoka uses this as an opportunity to do some for the audience exposition. Your skill with a weapon comes from your Mandalorian upbringing. Those skills alone will not be enough to defeat our enemy. She further explains that training the body is not the same thing as training the mind, and learning to wield the Force takes, and I quote, a deeper commitment. When Sabine asks how one learns to wield the Force, Ahsoka says, that is something you'll have to discover. Sabine grasses then on Huge Wang for saying that she's a terrible Padawan, but Ahsoka says that doesn't matter, and she has Sabine put on a helmet with the visor down. This all does look pretty familiar, doesn't it? Sabine says, I can't see, how am I supposed to fight? I can't even see, I can't see. How, how am I supposed, supposed to, to fight? fight? Sure does sound familiar too. Our shot. Then Ahsoka begins walking around and talking, ostensibly trying to help Sabine sense her presence, though she also tells her to follow her voice. And on and on and on it goes. Again and again we do it, walking, swinging, missing. Swinging, walking, missing. Missing, walking, swinging. Sabine getting more and more frustrated until finally Ahsoka trips her over. Sabine is annoyed. The lesson is, anger made you lose your balance. End the sequence, cut to the title slate. We are now seven minutes into a 30-ish minute episode, and the show's third episode overall. The opening recap takes at most 90 seconds, so being generous, we can say that that whole sequence took 5 minutes, and that is not far short of a quarter of the entire episode's runtime. By contrast, the scene I described in A New Hope begins pretty much exactly one hour into the movie, and in circa 3 minutes, we have the chess game between R2 and Chewie, we have Luke practicing with the lightsaber, we have Han dismissing the force, we have Luke trying and failing with the remote, we have Obi-Wan encouraging him while Han looks away, believing it all to be a waste of time, we have Luke trying again and succeeding, we have Han putting it all down to luck, we have 
Obi-Wan's rejoinder. In other words, inside three minutes, we get an important amount of information about four characters. After all, this scene is also our first proper introduction to Chewie and the Wookiees, on top of everything else. Okay. I don't have it. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. But sir, nobody worries about upsetting a droid. It's because a droid don't pull people's arms out of their sockets when they lose. Wookiees are known to do that. And we also get further development of the Force. We come away from the scene knowing much more about everyone involved, and also the Star Wars universe's most important underpinning spiritual dimension. What, by contrast, did we learn from the five-minute scene in Ahsoka? And by learn, I mean what information do we now have that we did not have before? Sabine is feisty and impatient, but we already knew all that. We've known all that since episode one, from her introduction on the speeder bike, to her stealing the testicle, to her clumsy fight with the droids, and to her impulsive attack on Billie Eilish. She is strong will, but she lacks talent and finesse? Well, we already knew that as well, see above. She has no aptitude for this sort of thing? Well, I think we already knew that too. This scene actually calls back to the moment we learned it in episode 2. I have known many Padawans over the centuries, and I can safely say your aptitude for the Force would fall short of them all. She makes for kind of a pretty boy? I mean, I guess the outfit's more revealing. Hu Yang is blunt and efficient and doesn't bother sparing people's feelings, but we already knew that. Again, see episode 2. Ahsoka is cold and distant and stern, and not particularly supportive. Well, we've known all that since episode 1. She perhaps wasn't a very good master? I hmm? think we already knew that as well. Again, that is the premise of their relationship. Known it since the beginning. She and Sabine have a tense relationship bordering on antipathy. Their characters clash. They're not a good fit. Um, I think we've known that since episode 1 too, because, you know, they were introduced that way. On the most superficial level, we do learn that old Jedi droids would train students in this way. On a slightly more meaningful but still quite superficial level, we get a glimpse of what Ahsoka and Sabine's relationship as Master and Padawan off-screen might have looked like. In other words, the scene is showing us for the first time what it's already taken such a very long time laboriously telling us across the first two episodes. But that's kind of it. In other words, in taking more time, a full two minutes more, the scene has told us nothing that we did not already know about anyone in involved in it or about the Force. It gave us one superficial bit of information, and on top of all of that, it leaves us wondering just what Sabine and Ahsoka were doing all the time they were supposedly together off screen if this is the level of training they're picking up at. Foundation level introduction to basic stuff about the Force. The show wants us to believe they spent a good long time together, but it acts as if they didn't spend so much as five minutes on Sabine's training. Going back to where we began, this is a hyperspace journey we actually could have skipped. As evidenced by the complete nothingness it tells us about anyone involved in it, versus the very, very packed and informative scene that A New Hope spent less time setting up for us. It's symptomatic of the big flaw across the first half of this season. It takes a very long time to establish absolutely nothing. It's really just filling time. It's sometimes a good idea to reiterate points in order to stress them, but if you've already wasted two episodes banging on about all of this in dialogue, then stressing the same same point in action is pretty redundant. This is a scene that should have replaced two or three dialogue exchanges from earlier episodes. It's not a scene that should follow those dialogue exchanges. The point has been stressed enough. Further repetition is redundant. Quit wasting my time, show. I mean, sure, Sabine's not bad to look at, but you shouldn't be sitting there wondering if a boredom wang might cheer you up. She's meant to be a character in a Star Wars show, not a generic twink from a gay porn site. Speaking of porn, we at last cut away to more spaceships. Look! A-Wings! Home one! Look at all the spaceships! Now that's a wank I could get behind. Oh yeah. You could hyperdrive me with your modified MC-80A Home 1 type heavy star cruiser. Sadly, this is then ruined by more dialogue. Hera has arrived for a meeting with some senators. How are you supposed to masturbate to that? The senators include Mon Mothma and four others whose names are not worth taking up your headspace. Mon Mothma asks about Hera's kid, because Hera has a kid, in case you weren't aware. His name is Jason. His dad was Kanan Jarrus, who was a human, and Ezra's master in Rebels, I think. And he's dead. All of which is barely relevant information. The kid will pop up briefly a little bit later, but he's more notable for the potential wasted than delivered on. The fact his dad is dead doesn't seem to impact him, or Hera, or indeed any other character very much. He's just name dropped every now and then, so Rebels fans have to change their underwear. The point of the reference in this scene, Mon Mothma asking after Hera's son and his friend Chopper, or kid's only friend is a remote controlled dustbin. Hope there's a therapist on the ship somewhere, or the kid's a prime candidate for knights of running a school somewhere anyway. The point of this scene is to convey that Mon Mothma and 
and here are our friends. Hence their easy banter, knowledge of, and interest in each other's families and personal lives. Were this actually building towards something, some important relationship that will be exploited later on, I'd say that's actually a fairly decent little introduction. It's not groundbreaking, but it is at least efficient, which can't be said for anything else in the show. Except, of course, that it isn't really building toward anything at all. At no point will their personal friendship really impact events. They are friends, we glean that from this scene, but it doesn't really mean anything. And that's because Mon Mothma in this show isn't really a character. The role she should be playing is taken up by references to Leia, who never appears on the screen except by name, and who on a couple of occasions will bail Hera out of trouble later, but we'll discuss her more in due course. I mention it now, though, because if, like me, you watched and very much enjoyed Andor, you might be expecting Mon Mothma to be, I don't know, clever. In Andor, she's shown to be a highly competent, highly brave individual living a double life, keeping up appearances as a senator and taking immense personal risk in opposing the Empire by official and covert means. She's savvy, she's smart, she's under significant stress, but she keeps things together. She's a shrewd operator. Where her public agency is restricted, her private agency compensates. She sees through lies and deception. That character is not in this show. The Mon Mothma in Ahsoka is just a drip. In service to their overarching goal, that of portraying the New Republic as fragile, vulnerable, strangled by bureaucracy and an easy victim to manipulation and subversion by agents of the Imperial Remnant, Filoni and co have defanged Mon Mothma entirely. She is, throughout this show, portrayed as something very much like Chancellor Valorum in The Phantom Menace, well-intentioned but utterly overwhelmed, shackled by the bureaucrats, incapable of action. And it begins in this scene. It begins right at the beginning of this scene, when she's interrupted by one of the senators beside her who hurries her along because he has other places to be. She bashfully accepts the rebuke and business begins. Forgive me, Madam Chancellor, but if we could just hear the General's report, we're late as it is. Quite right, Senator Ziona. Hira explains what happened in the previous episode, the Imperial Loyalists on Karelia, the attack, etc. Another senator immediately cuts her off and dismisses these Empire Loyalists as outliers. Where I was attacked by Imperial Loyalists, still working for Morgan Elspeth. Outliers. She repeats almost word for word the line from earlier, we have former Imperials working at every level of the New Republic government. We have we will former still find Imperials, ex-imperials at every around level, every of, the level of, of the New Republic government. Now I think, I'm not sure, but I think the show wants us to be wondering whether some of these senators might themselves be secret imperial agents. The fact this line was word for word the one given by an actual imperial collaborator in the previous episode is one big hint, though it's put in the mouth of a senator who'll go on to be pretty well irrelevant in everything that follows. Here's primary antagonist is someone else. It's this guy, Senator White Adjacency. He'll be a constant thorn in her side. One might even call him a thorn in her side. <laughs> Uh, no. And the one most involved in rubbishing all Hera's plans and statements and the connection she tries to draw between the Imperial Loyalists and Thrawn. That happens in this very scene, as Hera states her belief that there is indeed a link between the Imperial Loyalists and Thrawn. Mon Mothma asks if she's certain of it, and Hera asks for approval to send a task force to investigate. This is all rubbish by Senator White adjacent here, but before we deal with him, I think we have to point out that Hera should have much more evidence than she's able to present here. There were, after all, plenty of droids at the Corellian shipyard. There might be cameras as well, though let's be honest, there's only about five cameras in the entire galaxy. But the nature of their arrival on Corellia meant the Imperials had no time to delete records, destroy files, etc. And we know they have records and files, since Ratface literally held one in his hands and told us that it had classified information on it on the last episode. Oh, there it is. Classified. Moreover, though they did their level best to kill all potential witnesses because they are dumb, Hera and Ahsoka did leave a few alive. They were, in fact, captured. We saw it at the end of the episode. And Mando Season 3 tells us that the New Republic has sophisticated mind-raping technology that's used to crack the will of ex-Imperials. That's what did for Dr. Pershing in Episode 3, after all. Uh, mm, wait, uh, this is a mind flare. This is a 602 mitigator. It's a non-invasive experimental treatment recently approved for rehabilitation. No, it's a mind flare. The show's out here is that there is simply an investigation ongoing, and given what we know of the New Republic, we know not to trust that process. It'll take forever, it'll probably turn up inconclusive results. Though that out doesn't really survive the bouquet of evidence available to them, and shouldn't survive the fact that Mon Mothma is Chancellor of the New Republic, and Leia is, as we'll learn a little later, Chair of the Defense Council. To have us accept the assumption that the New Republic cannot and will not act, we also have to accept that these two characters have been nerfed for the writer's convenience, even though 
everything we know about them from every other depiction we've seen strains against this nerfing. They would have means at their disposal to push the investigation and to mount private investigations, and they would have plenty of evidence to investigate. Hera should also have more support. We can grudgingly accept that Ahsoka's word mightn't carry much weight if she were here, and that she lost the map that might have been useful evidence, even if she can draw a direct link between ruined temples and attacks by Imperial loyalists and tracked enemy vessels and, shortly, giant evil hyperspace rings. But do you know whose word might have carried more weight than hers? Luke Skywalker's. Except that Ahsoka inexplicably didn't bother to tell Luke anything about her hunt for Thrawn when she met him in Boba Fett, and nobody ever thinks it worth telling him anything for the duration of this season. And Disney Star Wars has somehow progressed without so much as touching on his new Jedi Order and what relationship it may have with the New Republic. But this is all an explanation, it's not an excuse. Luke's absence from events in this show really isn't excusable. The guy is head of the New Jedi Order, and he's a galactic hero, and Ahsoka knows him personally. Had she told him what she was up to when she met him back in Boba Fett, had she kept him in the loop, had she, or anyone else, taken any opportunity to inform him about any of the events in this show, he would have been able to help. There is no diegetic explanation for his absence. He should be present, but he's not, for nothing even approaching reasons. He just isn't in it. What a load of shit. Anyway, Senator White adjacent accuses Hera of, and I quote, Isn't this just another attempt to gain New Republic resources to aid in what has ultimately been your personal quest to find Ezra Bridger? Um, just just hold on a second. Let's, um, let's rewind to that scene from way back in episode one, where Ahsoka presents Hera with the map for the first time. If Thrawn survived, does that mean Ezra... Yeah, you see, these two clips can't really come from the same show, can they? So, Hera has staged multiple attempts to divert New Republic resources to find Ezra, who she believed was dead until two episodes ago. I don't really think you can even get around this by portraying, as the show never does anyway, a belief that Ezra is dead being the result of a long and expensive search that ruled out other possibilities. He and Thrawn disappeared from the entire galaxy, and she did believe they were both dead. But now we learn she she didn't believe they were both dead, and she'd been searching for them, even though Ahsoka was searching for them, and apparently hadn't looped Hera in on any of it in episode 1, since Hera had no idea what Ahsoka had been doing or what the map was until Ahsoka told her. Nah, I just think the writers haven't been reading each other's scripts again. There's always room, and as long as you adhere to a certain aesthetic, and we all agree uh, that it feels like, is it Star Wars or not? If it feels like it's Star Wars, there's a lot of room for how you can move around. And it's interesting too, as you see the panel and these great trailers, how different they all are, but how they all sit together. You know, you would never group them together, but thanks to the world that George created, they all feel like they share a common, a common uh, underlying aesthetic. The dark side of the Force has clouded their vision, my friend. Hundreds of writers are now under the influence of a Sith Lord called Kathleen Kennedy. I don't believe you. The directors of the Lego movie were once in league with this Kathleen Kennedy. But they were betrayed six years ago by the Dark Lord. They came to me for help, told me everything. You must join me, Obi-Wan. And together, we can destroy the bitch. A tense exchange follows where Hera points out that Senator White adjacent never fought in the war, he just sat back to see who would win. And then the character of the New Republic is further muddled somewhat. We as senators serve the people of that republic and I can tell you, they want no part of any further conflict. Now, this is, in isolation, serviceable. It harks back to the interwar years in the real world, where the establishment and public opinion was very much against taking the Nazi threat seriously, because everybody was desperately hoping for peace. They just couldn't stomach the idea of another war so soon after the last one. It led to some truly catastrophic decisions being taken. In the UK, it took a good long time for the Conservative Party to even begin talking about rearmament, and the Labour Party was voting against rearmament right up until the point War broke out. That's not to score political points in the present, by the way. Public opinion at that time was staunchly in favor of appeasing Hitler, even after he'd broken several treaty obligations, retaken the Rhineland, and begun an extensive military buildup. Politicians are ultimately fickle creatures. They will, usually, in the end, go where their base leads them. Denialism would be a perfectly believable character for the New Republic to take on so soon after the Galactic Civil War. Though I have to point out that this is the first time anyone has so much as hinted that this might be its character. 
we've never actually spent any time among its citizens. Nobody we followed throughout the post-Empire timeline has been at all concerned with it, and the Mandalorian in particular squandered a number of opportunities it could have taken to show us what the people of the New Republic really think about the New Republic. And then in the second place, it slightly confuses the whole thing. To tell the story as clearly and efficiently as possible, you'd really stress one or the other of these concepts. Either a New Republic too cowardly to face war, or a New Republic deliberately diminished by Imperial agents. A full story would absolutely have the time and space to explore and link both concepts, but given how much the writers have been struggling to get even one of them clear in their own heads, expecting them to meaningfully build out their world in multiple dimensions is way too much to ask, so I'd settle for one or the other. As it is though, this scene leaves us unsure just who thinks what and why. Is it Imperial subterfuge, or is it cowardice, or is it both, or is it neither, or one in one instance and another in another, but if so, which is which and when? And that's pretty much all we're going to get on the subject, because we're about to hyperspace out of this galaxy entirely. So those questions will remain forevermore. It just smacked of a few half-realized ideas, not actual consistent thought-out world building. Hera then gets to do a bit of semi-diegetic exposition, telling the audience who's never heard of Thrawn before who Thrawn is and why he's to be feared, and why she gives a shit, which is just about fair enough, since it's believable Thrawn wouldn't have been widely known to everyone in the galaxy. So yeah, maybe these senators did need that exposition just as much as the audience did. Thrawn is not your typical Imperial officer. I know because I fought against him. He killed friends, people who were like family to me. I've spent most of my life fighting a war, and that's why I'm trying to convince you to help me prevent another one. So if we're supposed to believe that the New Republic has been infiltrated at every level by Imperial agents, and the New Republic now knows about Thrawn, mightn't it get back to the Imperial remnant that Thrawn isn't back yet, and mightn't even be coming back at all? Remember, in Mando Season 3, which we now know occurred before all of this, Moff Gideon, himself a spymaster, hasn't even heard a whisper of Thrawn. I hear whispers from one end of the galaxy to another, and never a word of yep, Thrawn. like he just said there. There's already division in the Shadow Council over the wisdom of waiting for him. The plans of Admiral Pelion and Ginger Tossa Sr. here rest on the Shadow Council believing their own lies. Per that Shadow Council meeting, they've been pooling all their resources waiting for Thrawn's return, even at the expense of underfunding their allies. We individually scrape and claw resources awaiting the grand plan to take shape, while you and Peleon amass countless resources and equipment which should be shared. And yet none of those resources has reached Morgan Elspeth, apparently, who is the only one who can engineer Thrawn's return. And they have no way of knowing whether his return is possible, never mind imminent, which was Pelion's promise to the Council. So if Imperial agents got word from any of these senators that Thrawn is actually still missing, and in a different galaxy, and they don't even know if he's still alive or if it's possible to bring him back, well, wouldn't that massively alter the dynamic in the Shadow Council? The rest of these muffins would surely feel betrayed by Pelion and Hux, since we already know they've been agitating for a change in plan anyway. You have spoken of his imminent return. Perhaps it's time we look to new leadership. Hear, hear. This information could believably shatter the Imperial Remnant for good. But again, that relies on consistent world building, on writers talking to each other and reading each other's scripts, and on the quaint old fashioned idea that things have consequences, so fuck it all, I guess. Hera's pitch, sensible enough, is that preparing for war is the only way to avert war. Senator White adjacent says that Thrawn is dead, and Ezra is dead too, and this causes Hera to get very emotional. Grand Admiral Thrawn is dead. And I'm sorry to say, it is my opinion that your friend Ezra Bridger heroically died with him. You don't know that. Yeah, that's why you don't put women in the military. They're just too emotional. They can't cope with it. They do crazy, unpredictable things like getting angry when you say someone's dead, even though they also believed he was dead until they forgot that's what they believed five seconds ago. That's not possible. Thrawn died at the Battle of Lothal. If Thrawn survived, does that mean Ezra? Mon Mothma asks for a moment to speak with her colleagues, and this apparently means that Hera has to leave the room. They can't just turn their holograms off and talk in private? Why does Hera have to leave the room when she's the only one of them actually in the room? Our shot outside, we run into a child. This is Jason Sindulla. Jason is, as mentioned, the son of Hera and Kanan Jarrus. Um, hmm. Mm? 
Really? Mm, something about this kind of isn't adding up to me. That's not how biology works. Jason is unfortunately young enough to be very annoying. The thing about Star Wars is that it didn't inspire a generation of kids because kids were in it. It inspired a generation of kids because there were no kids in it. I'm sure everyone agrees that Revenge of the Sith got infinitely better once Anakin got rid of all the children. In order, uh, in order to massacre all the Jedi, in order to form a galactic empire, which he wants, he wants to rule that and also overthrow the Emperor because he wants to stop Padme dying in childbirth and only, only Palpatine can help him by having him... Uh, yeah, look, as much as I love the prequels, the films make no fucking sense. Anyway, Jason is young enough to be very annoying because only one child actor in around three million can actually act, but he's also young enough to be very annoying because, had they made him just a little bit older, he could have gone along with Ahsoka as her apprentice, thereby paying off an important part of his character. His dad was a Jedi and he is Force-sensitive, while also giving us a character who who, like Luke in A New Hope, really doesn't know much more than we do about the galaxy as a whole or the rest of the people he's accompanying. You could still have played on Ahsoka's inadequacies as a master. Jason is already older than Jedi are supposed to be when they start their training. If you add another couple of years, have him around 14 or 15 years old, he could be surly and stroppy, which would make Ahsoka surly and stroppy as well. The bedrock of their relationship could have been Ahsoka's friendship with Hera and the knowledge that Jason's dad died, which would add tension and emotion. She'd secretly find him really annoying and want rid of the brat, but she'd also fear failing him because it would mean failing Hera. Jason would be more susceptible to the lure of the dark side, or the not-quite-dark-side alternative that Big Ray is pursuing because he knows that he's not really wanted here and because Ahsoka is not a very good master. Big Ray could have played on Jason's vulnerability. Something about old monks preying on children's vulnerabilities just seems so innately plausible for some reason which could be a source of tension between Big Ray and Billie Eilish, who might then feel cast aside, creating more drama and conflict there, while Jason also has the all-important quality that resonates with a core Star Wars audience. He is a young male, not a girl boss superhero twink thing. Think about it. So very many of this show's problems could have been solved had Jason been the deuteragonist of the piece. Audience's lack of knowledge? Fixed, because he's a novice as well. Shallow and unrelatable main characters with a conflict nobody understands or really cares about? Fixed. We have people to invest in now. Actual as opposed to manufactured tension between main characters that's born of love and loyalty and the fear of failure? Yep, we could have had that too. A tangible link between the heroes and the villains that allows for dynamic interaction, for temptation, for betrayal, and then for redemption. Well, yeah, we could have had that. A young hero the core audience can relate to, and a younger audience might want to embody. Yep, we could have had that. A character with room for meaningful growth and the ever-present threat of failure. Yep, that would have been fun. Thematic links between Ahsoka's struggles with mastery, and memories of her old master and his terrible fate, and the student that's been thrust on her? Hmm, that sounds pretty interesting to me. We could have had her fear that she might in turn have produced another Darth Vader. So much about this show could have been so much better, more feeling, more informative, more meaningful, had Jason taken Sabine's place. Hell, Sabine could still be in the show, don't get me wrong. She could serve something loosely analogous to Han Solo's role, as Ahsoka loosely resembles Obi-Wan and Jason loosely resembles Luke. A radically different perspective, a skepticism about magic and the usefulness and meaning of the Force, a more physical gung-ho presence to counterbalance the cerebral prattlings of the Jedi, and an alternate mentor figure to young Jason, like a cooler, older sister. God, I've really got to stop. Yeah, imagining how good this show could have been is... Yeah, it's pretty painful. In the show we actually got, Jason has a few scenes here and there. This is the first one. He says he wants to be a Jedi. Ira says she knows he does. I want to be a Jedi. Yeah, I know you do, Jason. Scene transition. Yeah, that was um, that was our first introduction to this character for most of us. I'm sure we learned so very much. Back on the ship, still in hyperspace, Ahsoka and Sabine have another tedious chat. Sabine asks if the urgency of their situation might speed up her training a bit, and Ahsoka says nah, and Sabine says well she can't feel the force anyway. Which is true, I don't think this can be emphasized enough. Sabine is not force sensitive. She never has been force sensitive. Nobody had any reason to believe she could be force sensitive. She would never even have been a candidate to be trained as a Jedi she's far too old for one thing, but most pressingly, she isn't Force-sensitive. In no version of the canon would she have been a candidate, whether the Force in its older spiritualist guise or in its newer midi-chlorium-related guise, if you don't have it, you don't have it. It moves through everyone and everything, but not everybody can move it. And that's fine. It's possible to be an interesting character 
and not be a Jedi. In fact, most of the interesting characters in Star Wars history are not Jedi. The prequels added thousands more Jedi than the OT, and none of them was as interesting as any given non-Jedi from the OT. Who the fuck is this guy? Tell me about this man. Who, who even is he? Jedi can feel the Force in others. Obi-Wan can feel the Force in Luke, as can Vader, and Yoda, and the Emperor. Qui-Gon feels Anakin's presence long before he confirms his theory with a midi-chlorian count. Nobody ever felt it in Sabine. And even then, there'd be a simple way to confirm it either way. Check her midi-chlorian count. God damn it! I'd put money on it being under five, five midichlorians at most. But Disney Star Wars really can't make up its mind about the Force. The Last Jedi was praised by absolute fucking morons for seemingly showing that anyone could potentially use the Force. It has nothing to do with fate or with bloodlines. Mando season three has it, but it is very much to do with bloodlines. Hence Gideon taking Baby Yoda's blood and using it to create Force-sensitive clones of himself that he inexplicably didn't think were worth guarding. He just stood around waiting for Mando to destroy them, and then he bitched about it after the fact. I was isolating the potential to wield the Force, and incorporating it into an unstoppable army. And you smothered them before they could draw their first breath. Even though he hired three Praetorian guards, he has hundreds of jet troopers, he has himself, now he just stands there and waits, because he's a dick. Ahsoka is now taking a turn back toward the TLJ reading of things, because it's taking a non-Force sensitive Sabine here, and it will show her a couple of times trying and failing to use the Force, the simple reason being that, you know, she doesn't have it, and then it would imply that because she tried a couple of times to use it and she really wants to have it, this will count as training. And so between episodes 7 and 8, she will go from complete Force insensitivity to significantly powerful Jedi Lady. That's not how the Force works. Ahsoka outright tells her in this scene that the Force is in everyone, and the only reason everybody doesn't use it is that not everyone can handle the training and the discipline. But training and focus are what truly define someone's success. Not everyone can handle the type of discipline it takes to master the ways of the Force. This is shit, Dave. This is really shit. You don't even have to like midi-chlorians very much to acknowledge that a new democratic version of the Force is just so much worse. It doesn't just make the Force more common and less rare, it makes a mockery of the whole idea of training with it. And it doesn't just do that, it cheapens the whole idea, and it doesn't just do that, it cheapens the Jedi as a whole. And it doesn't just do that, it cheapens everyone who is not a Jedi. Since rather than exploring and exploiting anything else that makes Sabine unique, a Mandalorian heritage for example, a history with that culture, her experience in its civil war, her once mastery of the Darksaber, her knowledge of unique weapons and armor, nah, fuck all that, just stick a lightsaber in her hand and parrot empty vague platitudes about the Force, and then have her super powerful. That's what makes a good character, guys. Fuck you, Dave, that's just pathetic. There was once an old MMO called Star Wars Galaxies, and it's an instructive parallel, I think, with Disney Star Wars. When it began, it was fiendishly difficult to become a Jedi. You could become a Jedi, but it required dozens of hours worth of quests, hours of quests just to discover the Force even, and hours more to hone specific skills, and hours more on other specific series of quests, plus fulfilling a number of other criteria, at the end of which you just about managed to become a Padawan. To become an actual Jedi, you have to do dozens of hours more questing, and if you use the force or your lightsaber in public, you could find yourself with player bounties on your head. The idea being that at this stage in galactic history, Jedi were rare and in hiding, and immersion would be ruined if you had thousands of player Jedi running around Imperial controlled planets during the height of the Galactic Empire. They made it hard because it's supposed to be hard, because that's what the world demanded. Because it was so hard to do, very few people completed it, and everybody had to begin the game as one of any number of other non-Force sensitive races with any number of non-Jedi professions. It made the galaxy more varied, alive, and true to the source, and the game became really popular. People loved it, everything was player driven, and the absence of traditional class systems, and crucially the absence of Jedi, meant that you could create really unique characters with unique roles and skills, and lo and behold, people did. That's what brought the galaxy to life. 
That's what made the game popular. The absence of Jedi specifically created a highly dynamic environment and a sense of a lived-in galaxy, and people flocked to it. But LucasArts was very concerned, because, you see, marketing really wanted there to be Jedi in the game. Never mind that the game was selling pretty well and getting pretty popular, they thought it couldn't possibly sell and get popular unless people could see and be Jedi, because the Jedi are Star Wars, right? That's what makes Star Wars so recognizable. Nobody could possibly enjoy Star Wars unless they could be and see Jedi. That's how this works. So they force changes to make it easier and easier to become a Jedi. And because being a Jedi is pretty awesome, everybody abandoned their old organic playstyles and started skewing the game. It became nothing more than a grind to get Jedi status, which began breaking the game since so much of it relied on organic communities and varied playstyles. And then they said, fuck it, let's create quite possibly the worst patch in all existence. It was called the NGE, or the New Game Experience. Rather than highly individualized and unique characters, they introduced a really lame and shallow class system. They said, nah, let's just let people choose Jedi right from the beginning, while also kind of, you know, forgetting to remove loads of the old quests from the old system, so you'd end up having random old men lead you thousands of miles into the desert for a training mission that no longer existed. Everybody chose to be Jedi, because of course they did, because it was so easy, because the Jedi really are amazing. And then the game got tired and boring, and it shed a vast number of players and it died. Because they looked at the Jedi, they said, there can be no interest in Star Wars without the Jedi, let everyone be a Jedi, and then everything died. The point of this comparison is that what makes the Jedi so iconic isn't just lightsabers and the Force, it's not just the epic fights or the sense of fate and destiny. Of course everyone wants to be a Jedi, but what makes them so popular is that not everybody can be a Jedi. The law of diminishing returns is as inevitable as balance in the Force. The more accessible something is, the more easily attainable, the more common, the more other people have it, the less special it is, the less remarkable, the less it can inspire dreams and aspirations. Everybody wants to be a Jedi because not everybody can be a Jedi. If everyone could be a Jedi, what would be the point? And that is kind of what Sabine represents here. It's what she represents in a way Jason wouldn't, by the way, because Jason's character history is with the Jedi. His father was one. The Force runs in his bloodline. But none of that's true of Sabine. For Sabine, the Force is like those muscles she definitely doesn't have. If you work out enough, you can just get it. Try moving a mug a couple of times, then just wait for the writers to say, yep, that's, that's pretty much good enough, enough time has passed, then pow, you have total and complete mastery of the force. Well done. Uh, yeah, well that was a fun aside. Now back to boring. We are still hyperspacing across the galaxy. Huge Wang and Ahsoka have a quick checkup in order that Ahsoka gets to tell the very, very slow target audience exactly what the previous scene was about. Sabine is frustrated, she says. Everything's unconventional now, etc. She also says, and I quote, I don't need Sabine to be a Jedi. I need her to be herself. Um, well, fine. Except that, you know, earlier you literally just said, Your skill with a weapon comes from your Mandalorian upbringing. Those skills alone will not be enough to defeat our enemy. Uh, so being herself is actually not enough. Which is it you want, orange lady? Sabine, I've got Hera. Yeah, good on you, you Mug. Well? Don't give in to this butchery of the Force. Resist her! Mug is the best character in this episode. Hera then holograms into the cockpit to tell them that neither she nor the New Republic fleet will be joining them for this mission. And you might be thinking, well, Hera's had no trouble going off on personal missions before, has she? She and Ahsoka went off on an unauthorized visit to Corellia just last episode. Nearly blew up a shipyard. Nobody told her off for it. Isn't she supposed to be independent-minded, have a bit of that old rebel spirit in her? Isn't she just burning with this newfound passion to find Ezra and kick Thrawn in the Smurf berries? If she went up to Corellia on a mere hunch, why isn't she jumping in her ship immediately and flying off after them alone, or maybe with some old friends from the Rebellion? Like that big purple guy we saw in one scene in Mando and then never again? I think he was in Rebels. Well, the answer is that though all of this is true, the plot isn't quite ready to acknowledge it yet. That's in the next episode. You see, look, the script says it's not time for her to do that yet, so we gotta do what the script says. Then the transmission cuts out, because it's being jammed, yet I can't help but notice that we are still in hyperspace. This is apparently because they have entered the relevant planetary system, and I, I suppose it's possible to jam communications in an entire star system from your one fairly large space ring, probably? A huge Wang also tells us, Our last scan indicates the transport was in orbit on the far side of the planet. However, there also seems to be a second object. So the ring can jam communications in an entire star system, but it can't stop you scanning the star system from outside? 
the star system? Um, mm hmm. Okay, rightio, not sure about that, but you know, we'll run with it. He says he also picks up a second object on his scan, something big, but with a signature that's unknown to him. And he didn't tell anyone about this before now, because then he'd not have been able to tell them about it in this scene for our benefit, because that's how writing works, you see. But given we're about to learn that this unknown signature is just a massive version of the old hyperspace rings used by the Jedi in the Clone Wars, isn't Huge Wang the best place to know exactly what it is? Remember, this is the guy who trained Jedi at the temple, the guy who keeps reciting Jedi mission protocol because that's stuck in his programming. Standard Jedi mission protocol when approaching an unknown situation. In order to avoid enemy surveillance- He's still doing this? Programming. This is just a bigger version of tech the Jedi use to hop about the galaxy. It's got bigger hyperdrives, it's massive, but its signature, whatever that means, should bear more similarities than differences with the familiar tech, no? If the signature is its shape, that should ring some bells. If the signature is shape plus placement of hyperdrives, then ditto. Unless he's talking about its hyperdrive signature, though it hasn't been to hyperspace for some considerable time, it's been waiting here to have the final hyperdrive transported in by somebody else. No, I think in truth, the word signature here means nothing. It's just dialogue thrown in to try and build up a sense of mystery and suspense. And before some idiot in my comment section says, Oh yeah, you need mystery and suspense. I agree. Fuck off. This criticism isn't about the presence of mystery and suspense. It's the way in which we seem always to have to contrive our way to mystery and suspense by having characters not share information when they should have shared information and by dropping in vague, meaningless words as a cheap means of achieving the desired effect. It is not a major flaw, but it is a flaw. And given the flaw is born of laziness, it's one that furthers a consistent theme. Small instances in one place often mean much bigger instances later on, and we've already Already had some pretty massive instances of laziness and cheap contrivance. Ahsoka asks if the signature could be a Star Destroyer, but obviously not, because the Imperial Remnant seems to have inexplicably lost all of their Star Destroyers, and Morgan seems not to be working with them very much anyway. Then, a whopping great six rather naff-looking snub fighters just kind of appear out of the ether. I guess the giant ring is blocking all scanners, because otherwise, there's no excuse for them not picking these guys up beforehand, is there? We know ships have scanners that can detect incoming fighters because we've seen it several times in several different ships all across Star Wars, whether it's Slave 1 detecting Kenobi's Jedi Starfighter or the Falcon detecting the TIE Fighter Scout in A New Hope. There's another ship coming in. Maybe they know what happened. It's an Imperial fighter. He's followed us! But no, no, they, they just didn't see these guys coming. I am tracking two squadrons of three craft. Oh. Okay. Well, so, so you can scan things now? You just didn't pick them up until they were right up your ass. Okay. He also says he's tracking two squadrons. Two squadrons of three craft each. Pretty sure the real world definition of squadron is a unit comprised of at least 12, but uh, maybe Star Wars just uses words differently than we do. Perhaps this is where a Ronin such as you belongs. She's not Ronin. Sabine trots back to the tail gun, and a long chase ensues. The fighters are not much of a threat, they land dozens of shots on the fleeing ship without causing any damage at all. You might reply, yeah, fine, the shields are up, so what's the problem? Though given how much of this sequence is shot to evoke the Millennium Falcon's escape from the TIE Fighters in A New Hope, I think it's fair to point out that shields in Star Wars do not usually block all incoming damage, they just mitigate it. The Falcon does take damage in the escape from the Death Star. The Lucre Hulks are able to penetrate the shields on the Royal Starship as it's fleeing Naboo. It's a fairly decent way of ensuring that space fights still have stakes and tension. And anyway, I'm bound to point out that these fighters will land several more shots on the ship even after it's shields are down, and they have precisely the same effect, which is to say they have no effect whatsoever. The other point of this scene, besides the references to better things, is in showing Ahsoka that she has to trust Sabine if they're going to work together. She can't have her own way all the time. She can't scold her way to success. So while she begins by giving the orders, and Sabine misses is all the shots, after prompting from Huge Wang, she begins asking Sabine what she needs and following her lead, which gives them marginally more success. Sabine, tell me what you need. Move on my signal? Copy. For it now! Two more down! You go, girl. 
Now, I do not mind this. It's more than a little bit formulaic, and it hasn't really built off of any development in Ahsoka's character. It's more a pivot out of desperation than anything built up. But it's an attempt to show rather than to tell character work, a meeting in the middle, Ahsoka easing off and allowing Sabine some agency, which is fine, although it feels a little bit out of place in the narrative. This is normally the sort of revelatory moment that settles an open question. This trust gradually builds into grudging respect, and then finally, even if it's motivated by desperation, the knowledge that you can work with this person after all. That is the completion of the arc. It's not usually a middle act device, but that is what it serves as here. These two seemingly have a moment of reconciliation in the heat of conflict, yet later on they'll revert to the status quo ante, which guarantees we're just going to have to repeat the same thing later anyway, but, you know, in isolation, it's showing not telling, it's not that bad. The chase proceeds for a little while longer until they get close enough to the planet that the giant ring appears from over the horizon. It's a pretty visual, but it's nice enough. There are quite a few pretty visuals in the show. Our shot, and I've largely avoided calling them out because, really, it should be the bare minimum we can expect from an eight-episode Star Wars show with a budget over a hundred million dollars. But then, given how cheap and tacky so much else in Disney Star Wars looks, I guess we should probably be grateful. Ahsoka might alternate between boring and terrible, but at least if you turn the sound off, it sometimes makes for a pretty screensaver. Stupidity quickly follows, however. Now Ahsoka and co are in range of Morgan's massive ring, it activates its turbo lasers. And we know that they're turbo lasers because Morgan quite clearly says, Prepare turbo lasers. There are a couple of things to note about turbo lasers. In the first place, it has previously been established that these are heavy duty things and they are not well suited to taking on small, fast moving fighters. We count 30 Rebel ships, Lord Vader, but they're so small they're evading our turbo lasers. We'll have to destroy them ship to ship, get the crews to their fighters. But we can be charitable and say that, well, quite a few years have passed since then, so maybe they improved the technology. In the second place, they are turbo lasers, laser being the operative part of the noun. Lasers are not solid objects. Lasers are made of light amplified by radiation. Lasers can cause things to explode, but they do not themselves explode because there is nothing in them to explode. Light cannot explode. Light emits no solid matter. So of course it would be absolutely absurd if, for example, Dave Filoni decided that laser flak cannons could be a thing, and because it would be absolutely absurd, it is exactly exactly what we get. How interesting. Uh, this is all kinds of dumb, but, but, a word in Filoni's defense, it is not without precedent. George Lucas decided that the Nantex class Geonosian fighters in Attack of the Clones should have laser flak cannons. And before you say, but they weren't laser cannons, platoon, they were purple. Yes, they were laser cannons, my pretty little re- at least according to Wikipedia, so it would be unfair to pin all of the blame for stupid on Dave Filoni. George Lucas taught him everything he knows after all, and then his apprentice murdered him in his sleep. The origin of this stupidity is George Lucas, but Filoni is the one who decided to do it again here and unnecessarily. If you flipped a single word from Morgan, you would have solved the problem. Just call them something else. Don't call them turbo lasers when they are quite clearly not lasers. Call them flak cannons for fuck's sake. Call them slug launchers. Call them turbo flak launchers. Call them anything you like. They are not turbo lasers. Lasers do not have flak. And on top of that bit of stupid, there is another. If you're approaching a ring-shaped object with turbo not lasers mounted around it, which is the angle of approach you think would be most likely to get you killed? Would it perhaps be flying right at the center of the ring, since you're then in range of the maximum number of available turbo not lasers? Now you'll have to bear with me as I throw some maths and dimensions shit at you. If the lasers are mounted on the outer edge of the ring, then flying to one edge of it would take the turbo not lasers on the outside of the opposite edge out of range. If they are mounted on the inner edge, then flying to one edge of it would take the lasers on the same edge out of range. Flying straight at the middle of it ensures that all the turbo not lasers can shoot at you. So naturally, that's exactly exactly what these fucking bellends do. They have to keep flying closer to it, by the way, in order that Huge Wang is able to scan it, because he can do that now, which he does. Scan complete. <laughs> Though the turbo not lasers then immediately penetrate their shields and knock everything offline. How very inconvenient. This, in fact, exposes quite a major design flaw in Morgan's massive ring, because when she asks one of her droids whether the ship has been destroyed, the droid tells her it has merely dropped off of scopes. Destroyed. They are off our scope.
Now, you might have noticed that Morgan has been watching all of this play out through a window, so she should be able to see for herself whether the ship has been destroyed. Pick up your visual scanning. But forgetting that she can see through windows for a moment, it transpires that her massive ring cannot detect objects entering it unless they are powered, because she is used to having large, powered objects shoved up her ring, and she's done it so often that small, unpowered objects just don't stimulate her anymore. I mean, appear on her scopes. <laughs> This means that anyone hoping to attack her massive ring need only propel themselves toward it and then turn the power off and coast. Without power, they would be invisible, meaning they could go straight into her ring without getting detected, and then suddenly turn on everything in order to give her a nasty shock. Aboard the drifting ship, Huge Wang appears to be rather fucked, but Ahsoka and Sabina pressing lots of random buttons in a bid to figure out what's wrong with their engines. The backup power is on, but they cannot move. And to make matters worse, Billie Eilish and her NAF fighters are closing in to finish them off. They need to buy themselves some time. And here is a superb example of the dynamic I mentioned earlier. The show is at its strongest when nothing happens. It's very hard to fuck up nothing. To its dubious credit, the show still manages to do some damage when nothing is happening, but this is vastly less destructive than the damage it does when stuff does happen. And stuff is now happening. It is a recipe for disaster, and Dave Filoni is an excellent cook. So Ahsoka runs out back and puts on a spacesuit. The NAF fighters are closing in. And you sit there thinking, gee, if these NAF fighters had proton torpedoes or missiles, our heroes would be completely fucked. They're in range, they'd have a lock, the ship has no shields, just, yeah, fire some missiles, blow it up. But the NAF fighters are indeed NAF, so they have no proton torpedoes or missiles, they just have the galaxy's shittest laser cannons. They fly closer. But then, on the side of the ship, a little door opens. And out walks Ahsoka. I assume she's learned the force power known as gravity, because this is generally not how space works. A single short shot of her boots would have been enough to mend at least part of it. The Expanse does it, 2001 A Space Odyssey does it, just a little short little clip, a couple of seconds to let the audience know that she's wearing mag boots. Even that wouldn't be enough to fix the rest, however. If you are bearing down on a disabled enemy ship and you want to kill everyone on that ship, and you inexplicably see one of the crew standing on top of that ship holding a couple of lightsabers, I would absolutely forgive you for looking shocked and disbelieving, and then laughing at how ridiculous the setup is. But then you, having what scientists in their technical parlance call a brain, would just aim right at the disabled ship and blow it up, wouldn't you? Job done. You don't need to swat that one random person on top of it. You want and need to destroy the whole thing. So, um, so just do that. It's disabled. The shields aren't up. It's, it's not going anywhere. Why are you aiming for her? These are Disney Star Wars villains, and so of course, despite having this big sitting duck right in front of them, they decide the best thing to do is aim directly at the woman with the lightsabers. And even that should work, since ship cannons are much more destructive and powerful than handheld laser guns. Hell, Obi-Wan doesn't even try to deflect the bolts from Slave 1 on Kamino, because the sheer force of them blasts him off his feet. Ahsoka is in a very, very low gravity environment. Even assuming a lightsaber and the person holding it could deflect a bolt from a ship-mounted laser cannon, which I doubt. The force of just one of those things would have sent a spiraling off into space, no? What's it that guy said about every force producing an equal and opposite reaction? Well, no, because this is Star Wars, and Star Wars isn't for serious people anymore. It's not even for serious children. It's for fucking morons. So the people who want to destroy the ship pointlessly shoot straight at Ahsoka's lightsabers. She shouldn't be able to deflect them, but she can and she does. The enemy fighters very obligingly and very stupidly move into melee range, despite being in fucking spaceships, which lets Ahsoka do low-G ballet and take one of them out. Uh, apparently lightsabers slicing through things experience absolutely no friction at all meaning the force of sticking one in a fast-moving spaceship does not yank Ahsoka off into the fast emptiness of space. It just leaves her comically floating past the fucking window. What am I watching? And why am I watching it? Why, God, mate, I don't know why you're taking such a long time with that door. Don't you know lightsabers can slice through anything instantly and completely ignore the laws of physics? This is just cartoonish, which is perfectly understandable since all these characters come from a cartoon, they were created for a cartoon, they were written for a cartoon by a cartoon, but it's not forgivable. Five-year-olds should not be your target demo, Dave. You're in live action now. Grow the fuck up. Sabine then manages to get the power back on and picks Ahsoka up. Billy Eilish lands yet more shots on the ship and doesn't leave so much as a scratch. At least like training lasers or something. And then we get another chase, this time down into the atmosphere of a planet where we encounter some massive tragedies. Oh good, the space whales. Hooray, we're doing uh, we're doing the space whales now. Yep, wonderful. 
And I'm actually seriously considering just skipping this section entirely because what's the fucking point? I could point out that ridiculous as they are in space, the whales are even more stupid inside the atmosphere since it just emphasizes questions like, um, what's powering them? Do they have engines? How are they disobeying the laws of gravity, Dave? How are they propelling themselves? How do they remain aloft? And you could sort of overlook things like that if you kept them in space because, yeah, you know, they're in space. It still makes precious little sense, but it's at least slightly easier to suspend disbelief over. But then, then, later in the show, we have to grapple with the fact that space whales can communicate through the Force and jump to hyperspace, and that each individual whale is apparently just as, if not more powerful, than a giant ring with six Super Star Destroyer hyperdrives on it. And then you realize that you're critiquing levitating space-dwelling hyperspace fucking whales, and you think, why? What's the point? What can I possibly achieve by doing that? Once you've reached this level, you've just kind of transcended criticism. You've broken the unspoken covenant between creators and critics that has it that we operate on at least a few shared assumptions about how things work. When we were reviewing this episode on Mr. Brown Alliance, someone in the chat boldly tried to compare these icons to the absurd with the giant asteroid worm in Empire Strikes Back. But that's actually quite a useful comparison for my case, since it highlights the suspension of disbelief and how much you can or should want to push it. The asteroid worm is just that. It's a big space worm that lives in an asteroid. It really doesn't pose all that many ridiculous or unanswerable questions. How did it get there? Well, you know, any one of a number of fairly plausible explanations. An invasion of the body snatchers, aliens arrive as spores drifting through space. No reason that some space dwelling creature mightn't lay eggs that drift through space and land in asteroids. The hardest question to ask of the worm is, wait, what the hell does it eat way out here in space? Does it eat rocks or minerals? Does it live off of radiation? And each of those answers is actually kind of plausible. What the worm does not do is fly through planetary atmospheres and also around in space, it does not communicate with Jedi using the Force, and it does not hyperspace between distant galaxies on a whim. You might, at a push, be able to sustain one or even two of their unbelievable aspects. I'd be much less perturbed by them if they lived exclusively in space, for example, or even exclusively in hyperspace, given the vast number of unknowns and unknowables about both. But when you pile all of these absurdities on top of each other in the way this show does, yet my head just slams repeatedly into the keyboard, here is what that sounds like when I put it into a text display speech program. Full off pop of piff half bull, ab full, bevel blood bluggage leg dot lab. Pi up with path, tabal gula bave, abfg, abg, gb, a afapic fagba, babbage will jump fail, covey, be, tabasful flop flap, flark. Anyway, by flying through the space whale tentacles, Ahsoka and Sabine lose their pursuers in the clouds and descend to the surface and land the ship to make repairs. Huge Wang wakes up, then they turn him off again in order to evade scanners because they don't want any power on the ship, which I don't think has ever been a thing in Star Wars before, but yeah, oh well. It allows Ahsoka and Sabine time to have a moment sitting quietly together in the cockpit while the pursuing ships scour the planet for them. Failing that, they go up and regroup in space. It would be really helpful if Morgan had the backing of, you know, the Imperial Remnant and a huge force of fighters and bombers and scanners and big ships and scouts to call on in just such a situation, but she doesn't because, um, um... I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Back in whatever the estrogen equivalent of a cockpit is, Ahsoka asks Sabine if she's alright. Sabine says, I haven't seen those creatures since the day Ezra disappeared. That's, that's it, that's the extent of their conversation. Good talk. Huge Wang then wakes up again and pulls up a scan of Morgan's massive ring. It is indeed a massive hyperspace ring, with no fewer than six Super Star Destroyer hyperdrives in it. He explains that such a ring would be able to hop between galaxies along hyperspace lanes following the migratory patterns of the fucking space whales. And he knows this because the information was all in the Jedi archives, meaning I once again have to ask why absolutely nobody of any relevance to anything went exploring over there. The Jedi Order didn't, the Galactic Empire didn't, even though all world-building pieces confirm they could and probably should have. After all, Palpatine worked with Night Sisters, so far the only people confirmed to have hopped between galaxies, even though they didn't until this show decided that that is what they did. The Empire wiped out the Jedi, took over Coruscant and the Temple, and we know that Creamy Sheev likes his arcane secrets. The hyperspace ring construction is modeled off of Old Republic tech, and it uses six hyperdrives from Imperial Super Star Destroyers. The Empire made two fucking Death Stars. A hyperspace ring would have been pretty damn cheap by comparison. The reason they didn't do that is that no one had thought to have them do that. But when you introduce this prospect now, using not new tech or even new information, but old information and old tech available to people who'd have been interested in putting two and two together themselves, well, it all becomes rather implausible. 
I'm not saying there's no way you could ever introduce travel between galaxies in Star Wars, but as with all extended and continuous universes with well-established canon, you do have to be quite picky and careful about how you introduce new concepts like this. You have to do it in ways that can explain why nobody before your current protagonists thought to do it. Whether the discovery of ancient history unknown to anyone, or the discovery of new technology, it requires ingredients that were not available to the most powerful and interested entities in earlier timelines. Ahsoka, by contrast, has taken the precise opposite approach, thereby inviting questions that it cannot answer. But, yeah, hey, at least the villains in this show had to do some work to build the massive ring and work out where they wanted to go. At least they didn't do anything so cheap and easy and generally available to everyone in the galaxy like hopping in the mouth of hyperspace whales. Nah. That'd just be shit. Elsewhere on the planet, Big Ray is still standing at Stonehenge. He has a small detachment of assassin droids and generic grunts. Seemingly, Billy Eilish flew all the way back up into space in order to radio down to him on the planet to tell him that the Jedi are on the planet somewhere. He demands that the lackeys go and find them, presumably in order that they can inform Morgan of their location so she can wipe them out from orbit using her massive ring, or you know, send bombers to do that, or more fighters, or any force of any composition with big explosive weapons that would definitely get the job done. Yeah, yeah that would be a really good plan. I am sure that's what they'll do. And the episode closes with one of those enigmatic stares Big Ray does so well. That's the end of episode 3, probably one of the best in the whole show because, as mentioned, so very little actually happened. At least, until the end, where stuff does happen and it becomes shit again, but never mind, never mind. Lots more stuff happens in episode 4, and true to form, lots of it goes quite severely wrong.